uh, for those of you who haven't attended, this is uh, the weekly update on ideas with beers uh, for transport professionals and campaigners and journalists interested in active travel and sustainable transport. Um, if you uh, want the slides afterwards, contact me on that address. Also send me relevant information uh, for the Tuesday. Thanks very much for everybody who's uh, supported us throughout the year. Okay, uh, here are the contents again. A general theme is to keep on with the struggle. Uh, going over new pieces to read and consultations, developments in the last week in UK and London. And every week we have slides on diversity, the delay slide, and uh, I quickly refer to the past articles to read, uh, which you can look at if you get the slides sent to you or if you look at the back issues. Uh, we normally do a thing on advertising, but that's kind of run out of steam for the moment and your victim blaming for tonight. Okay, so happy festive season. Uh, the one on the right, road open to Santa. Uh, and Christmas is, all I want for Christmas is a safe place to cycle. That's in Hackney. And that's in Croftdown Road, Dartmouth Park in London Borough of Camden. Hopefully, I don't know if those are going to be taken away, those barriers, but there's a Christmas tree in the carriageway. Uh, it looks like the kind of thing that, that Hans Monderman would have wanted, you know, just plonk some trees in the carriageway just to let motorists know that they have to watch out. Okay, and that's the cover of the Ealing Council magazine around Ealing. Uh, no complaints over new bollards. That's nice. Okay, here there's a lot to read and look at. Cycling UK is actually preparing for legal challenges to bike lanes, unreasonable removal, obviously Kensington High Street being the one you're thinking of, also the one Old Shoreham Road in West Sussex. Um, there was a rumor that was going to happen. It's actually gone up on the Cycling UK website uh, and it will apparently be fought with the Cyclist Defence Fund funding. Um, something on from Centre for Cities about how the pandemic uh, has affected air quality. I mentioned that last week. Another thing from Cycling UK, uh, increase in congestion would cost everyone a lot of money. So the return has to not be by cars. Uh, something on air pollution from tires. Uh, this was an article in Highways magazine, uh, a survey saying Tories are relying on Labour councils to be the ones who spend from the active travel fund. Um, you know, do read that research yourself. Uh, the low traffic highbury, that's a low a traffic neighborhood uh, website went up last week. Um, look at 10 minutes about net zero targets. That's from the team, including people like uh, Kevin, Kevin Anderson, Professor Kevin Anderson, who you should read on stuff to do with climate change. Also, Professor Gillian Annabel, you should look at. Uh, there was a thread on Twitter from Anthony Wells of YouGov. And he talked about some rubbish in the mail on Sunday, correctly calling it a voodoo poll, saying that, uh, you know, everybody hates LTNs. Um, and he explained why it's tosh, uh, not just that it's in the mail on Sunday, but the reasons for it. So it's an interesting Twitter thread to look at. Uh, Kevin Anderson again on Twitter, talking about its uh, six budget pero period and um, what's right and wrong with, about it. You may have seen the temporary relaxation of the enforcement of EU driver's hours rules. Uh, the driver's hours, I think, are too long anyway. It's only a small, um, it's a temporary relaxation uh, for the next few weeks, but um, it does highlight the problem of uh, lorry driver's hours. Okay, now here was 
something I uh, looked at and I had a different reaction to a lot of people. It's connecting Leeds transport strategy. And the heading in the graphic was our vision for Leeds is to be a city where you don't need a car. And yeah, that's great. And, uh, it, you know, do look at the document and the vision's great. The targets are reasonable, uh, although not as stringent as uh, the, the mayor's transport strategy in London. The time scale's okay. But when it actually comes to measures to cut use, I only see consider a workplace parking levy. And, you know, I have seen a lot of documents over the last 30 years saying, oh, it would, you know, it would be good to have maybe fewer cars around and yeah, you know, and it wouldn't it be good to have more active travel, etc. But when it actually comes to it, uh, they don't really have uh, the instruments to do it. And I think we have to get tough. Um, thread from Mums for Lungs, uh, they brought together over 100 organisations, including Mine Road Danger Reduction Forum, uh, calling for legally binding limits on small particles. Um, now, got a lot of uh, attention to a new paper from Professor Rachel Aldred. I did actually have something to do with it right at the beginning. Um, uh, and it's uh, cycling injury risk in London, impacts of road characteristics and infrastructure. And it showed both the safety in numbers effect and that advisory cycle lanes are hopeless and that car curb separation is good for uh, reducing casualties or casualty rates, I should say. Um, there was a little blog piece from some people on the British Medical Journal website opposing free parking in hospitals, which is good. Uh, continuing coverage about the uh, Rosamond Kissy Deborah case uh, with her daughter dying, uh, dying and uh, uh, from uh, respiratory problems and having a focus on poor air quality where she lived for a coroner's inquest. Um, small article by Karen Liebrich on the uh, uh, othering of cyclists. Um, got a lot of readers. A uh, good piece from Treasure as usual on his website about how all those people going on about uh, how emergency vehicles supposedly can't get through low, low traffic neighborhoods, which is not true anyway, don't seem to be that concerned about it when they're held up by motor vehicles. Uh, some more, um, an appeal for money for anti-road building. Um, a new campaign for transport for new homes, uh, an article about accepting LTNs uh, I highlighted last week, and also some more evidence on LTNs. And again, it's Rachel with more evidence on LTNs. And her study here uh, using vehicle registration finds statistically significant reductions in car van ownership um, in areas that have introduced low traffic neighborhoods and statistically significant, but smaller reductions in areas introducing other infrastructure such as cycle tracks. So our findings indicate that active travel interventions can reduce motor vehicle ownership, particularly interventions involving low traffic neighborhoods. Right, your victim blaming for tonight, uh, first of all, came from the student, I don't know what kind of students they are, uh, 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 child protection uh, people, and uh, going on about the best way to keep your child safe when cycling at night is to make sure they're visible to other road users. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think it's to do with the people who are driving, what they're up to, and getting them to watch out. Lincolnshire Road Safety Partnership involving police. Uh, uh, we don't always think about how we are noticed. This is about wearing high vis as a pedestrian walking on the pavement. Yes. I do hope uh, Chief Superintendent Andy Cox can have a word with him. Uh, here's the diversity page. Uh, we are now, now we have a regular uh, women's view slot, or two of them actually. 
And the, the other news this week is that there is a new updated issue of the Guide to Inclusive Cycling from Wheels for Wellbeing here. That's the fourth edition. So that's important for, you, for those of you who are engineering schemes um, uh, to, to accommodate uh, people with disabilities. And I just thought I'd remind you about this uh, protest outside the Daily Mail about Kensington High Street. There's our very own Ruth, uh, older woman, older Jewish woman, uh, was a single mother, so a few diversity issues there. The delay slide is now the what's happening slide, uh, still relating to the Active Travel Fund, uh, referring to the fact that uh, a letter from Bike is Best, Cycling UK and LCC was sent on August the 28th calling for Active Travel England to be set up swiftly. So we're waiting for Active Travel England to be set up and also Part 6 Road Traffic Act 2004 so people outside London can have uh, various bits and pieces which they can't have at the moment. Uh, on the ground in the UK, a uh, bit of animations, so hope you can see them. This is a protest on uh, the bike lane in Old Shoreham Road. Um, uh, protest at pop-up lanes being taken out by uh, West Sussex County Council. Um, eight to two voted for it to be kept in, but the cabinet member stuck to his decision to take him out. They were due to be coming out this week, uh, now in the new year due to operational reasons, whatever that may happen to mean. And in Oxfordshire, the Cycling Commissioner role was scrapped after she resigned. Uh, she really wasn't getting the support in terms of officer support, councillor support or a budget. So yes, you know, a lot of people think they can get away with that kind of greenwash, but it's not going to work. And uh, I'm glad that she kind of called them out. Uh, Greater Manchester delivered 24 miles of cycling walking routes using national government's ATF. That was announced today from Transport Greater Manchester. Newcastle, Gosforth High Street cycle lanes set to say, despite complaints of huge traffic jams. Now, Carlton Reid said that the BBC talking about this used the word controversial. And he said, well, why is it controversial? Um, so, you know, we're going to be talking about language, uh, referring you to the work that Rachel Aldred and Laura Laker are doing at the Active Travel Academy. Um, I do notice that, I mean, we are actually a very professional organisation. We always refer properly uh, to councillors and officers. Um, I think I can refer to scumbag clerks and because uh, I'm referring to that here because he had an article about how cyclists should see themselves as guests of motorists on the road. And that's exactly the kind of thing we need to oppose. And I think it's we need to push people in the uh, official road safety organizations to try and do that kind of stuff. Uh, that, that, I mean, they were set up by the motoring organizations 90 years ago, but uh, as described in my book, but uh, we do need to lean on them to say, look, you know, you can't have that kind of attitude towards cyclists. Uh, Aberdeen, oh, here's the plan for College Street. It's as if LTN 120 had never existed. No, that's not the way to do it. Now in London, yes, uh, the Hammersmith Bridge closure was overcautious and it could be reopened within weeks to pedestrians and cyclists, our uh, reports reveal. Let's hope it's just pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, on the Kensington Chelsea um, episode, Kensington High Street, do read the comment by LCC there. Um, Tom Edwards said that the TFL board on Kensington High Street, they were very disappointed and didn't understand the rationale of scrapping it. Uh, I think the rationale is that they just wanted to be anti-cycling. 
Uh, nice video of the new measures in Old Bethnal Green Road uh, on that link there. Uh, in uh, motorists could be hit, hit, that so-called uh, being hit by having to pay, pay something towards the cost you incur. Um, another case of looking at the language. Uh, £3.50 to drive into Great London. My personal take, it should be higher to reflect the external costs of driving compared to, say, cycling. Also take on the mythology of I pay a tax uh, in order to cut motor traffic and in order to get the revenue needed. Uh, it would also need to apply for people with cars registered inside London and it's two years away, which is too late. Um, ideally, it would fit in with the other charges so that we could go straight to a smart charging system per mile for different uh, types of motor vehicle. Um, TFL uh, have done some more counting and the proportion of journeys made by active travel increased significantly from 29% uh, before lockdown to 46%. Uh, in early summer uh, and gone down to 37% between July and September. So still up from 29% to 37%. Um, private transport increased, uh, in this, uh, however, from 38% before lockdown to 45% in March or June. So some positive, some negative. You can see that graphically here. That's uh, last year, uh, as before lockdown, green is uh, walking and cycling, went right up early summer, uh, public transport's down, still down, private transport, cars and vans have gone up, uh, walking and cycling back down a bit, but not back to where it was in the first quarter, so let's keep it up there. Um, since we're on London figures, I thought I'd go back to one I showed you a few weeks ago from the Centre for London. Uh, transport usage shift since 2000, uh, when Transport for London came into being. Uh, here's cars and vans, which have gone up, uh, partly because of cheaper financing, explosion in the use of vans use of uh, ways and other route guidance systems from about 2009. Um, public transport went up a bit and then it's kind of gone down. Walking is about the same and cycling has really only increased from 1.2% there to about 2.5%. So I would say record overall not that good, bearing in mind that people were talking about the need for modal shift around the early noughties. Uh, also here in the city, uh, we've got the repurposing of 39 parking spaces in a car park to a last mile logistics hub for walking porters and cargo bikes. Uh, that's good. So, uh, the Healthy Streets projects continue uh, if a bit slowed due to uh, reduced TFL funding and COVID. Uh, here's what's happening uh, in the Tottenham Court Road area in Camden. The Gower Street cycle lanes are in. I've cycled on one of them. Um, that's a step forward, but the ever watchful activist Linus Reese says, However, the design of the protected cycle lanes is very poor in places, no protection at junctions, much of the route has no protection at all. And at the northern end, cyclists heading north are directed in the wrong way, he thinks. That will no doubt be discussed by uh, Camden Cycling Campaign. I do know one of the local councillors, Councillor Harrison, had to defend what Camden's been doing, which is very good. Uh, to a, a local Labour Party ward meeting and uh, he had his work cut out for him. So it's, it's not just the Tories, local Labour members are, do tend to be quite uh, uh, car addicted, even in the inner city. 
Uh, Lambeth, here's a nice uh, other graphic from the Railton low traffic neighborhood with uh, how things have got better since it went in. And here we are on to all the reading, all the reading. This is what you have to, you can get the slides from me and read through all these things. Uh, all of these have been um, mentioned before. Uh, and I'm going to send them to you if you want. Um, uh, anything I knew which I should draw attention to? Uh, no, I've mentioned all these before. Uh, here's the summary of the active travel fund allocations and comments on them. And consultations and survey. I've mentioned the hit and run petition before, and it's got to over 100,000. That's good. There's still one on longer trailers, legally binding UK air quality targets, a Greenpeace petition, the Mums for Lungs petition, and one from Cycling UK. So do look at them. Uh, here, coming towards the end, here's uh, some a graphic from the ever I should, I was going to say readable, but it's more watchable. Dave Walker, how to help phase out cars in urban areas, not driverless cars. We want carless drivers. Uh, put them on so they can't move around. How's that? This is how you'd have to coordinate parking. Um, what you really need is this massive investment in clean and sustainable alternatives. He did have this rather nice little thing here, the driving wheel for those determined to use a car no matter what. I've got this idea that people who are really addicted to the sense of control should be given uh, the right kind of computer games, you know, like they can go and play Grand Theft Auto if that's what they really want to do. And, uh, you know, maybe we should make some sort of jokey comments about car culture and driver psychology. Uh, I thought I'd do something on how, you know, the old I pay a tax on how little drivers pay. Fuel duty is in there, VD is not much more. And when people say, oh, well, you know, it's regressive tax. Well, VAT is so-called regressive and you get 21% from that. And that's one of the things I think I might talk about in the new year. Here's some last slide. Here's uh, what I think we should be thinking of in the new year. First of all, keep up the momentum of the active travel funding of the schemes involved. That's how a lot of us have got on here. It was about the emergency active travel fund. Let's keep up with the momentum we've got. I want to talk some more about the official road safety movement and what's wrong with it. Uh, something about drivers paying something towards the cost they incur, uh, law enforcement I'd like to talk about, and a lot more, some ideas. I think, you know, up to Brian, but maybe move beyond the so-called just, just infrastructure. And so may I uh, suggest to you that you all get out walking and cycling over the break, try not to kill your family and others with COVID, and uh, after today, I shall see you in 2021. Brilliant, thanks, Bob. That's great as ever. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, I'd like to think that we did cover road safety a little bit, but we'll definitely go back to these ones. Uh, I, I was telling Steve before that we planned like a, um, a car regulation special in the new year. So that's one to, to eagerly await. Once we get this Christmas business out of the way, we can get into the the, the real uh, has anybody got any like points of order for Bob or anything that we've got slightly wrong before we move on I'm taking that as a no Sally Sally are you there hi hello Sally it's good to see you hello um right so I was going to talk to you again about play streets today but I'm not because I came across something else when I went to look at them this afternoon um and I'm going to bring up a question that I asked last week, which I didn't really get, a well, I didn't get a reply to. Um, and I'm gonna ask it again in a different context. So though, for those who don't know me, I'm, I'm doing research into 
historic uh, environmental units or environmental neighborhoods, which were the, the mid 20th century precursors, precursors to the low traffic neighborhoods. And I'm looking at Newcastle in particular, and there were lots of plans to develop um, what we would now think of as low traffic neighborhoods in Newcastle. So as part of that work, when they first started, they put in um, blocks of streets, which were just play streets. So they had signs saying no through traffic, from 8 a.m. to sunset and they were in groups so it wasn't just one street here or one street there and they weren't as we think of play streets now a sort of organized event they were um signs for for cars you know just to, to stop through traffic coming through these streets so i'm going to share a photograph of one that i looked at today All right can you see that yeah so um this is one of uh, the streets in Heaton, which is uh, a, a play street, and it's still a play street today. Obviously, um, the, the signs in themselves weren't really very helpful in, in stopping through traffic. And I think quite a bit of time later, possibly as much as 20 years later, all of that block of streets has um, since been completely filtered. So you can see the filter at one end here in the foreground. I think that happened in the early 90s, but I'm going to talk to somebody who was involved in that to find out a bit more about it. But my question specifically with, with this street, um, on, on one side here, the bigger building you can see is a school. And if I just zoom in, you can see this is the sign, Play Street, 8 a.m. to sunset except for access. But this school at drop off and pick up time is horrendous because even though this whole area has been filtered, you can still drive right up to the door at, at the school. And I guess access could mean access to the school. But I suppose my question is, if the, with this signage here, which says that there's a permanent uh, closure except for, for access to these streets, is it, there, is it then acceptable for that school, for example, to, to have a holder place street in that street and put up temporary barriers, letting in residents who want to come or people doing deliveries, but not allowing parents to come and park at the school? So that's sort of without bringing in, I mean, because to what extent is that sign um, the same as a school street sign? Um, and can it be enforced? So that is my question for today. Um, and if anybody has any ideas about that, uh, what the legality of that might be, I would love to hear from you. And that's all I have, I'm gonna stop sharing. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I'm definitely um, thinking Bryn, show me a sign, would be the guy that had, had asked for the where, where we've all and that. But if it is access only, um, yeah, it could be enforced. So we had John Dales the other week talking about the signs that you Constantine are out and, and whether that's enough of an order uh, to place through. Um, in my view, it is, but I'll be interested to see what, what Bryn says about that. I don't know whether anybody else has got any insights to share with Sally. Is Ranty in the house? Like, uh, there'll be a few people like, uh, yeah, well, I'll try and get to the bottom of that one. But what, when it comes to signs, I just speak to, to Bryn. Yeah. So I'll just say the reason why I think for, I mean, and this might apply to other schools in the country, but for us, it'd be quite interesting because we are not, the council here isn't putting in, in school streets because it can't enforce them. Um, and so in a way we have a school here, which has a head who's very much involved in um, trying to make the streets safer outside of school, would love a school street. And actually if that sign, if they could do that, you know, themselves, it would it might be a nice way of trying you know of kind of proof of concept really mm. yeah okay well yeah I'll, I'll get to the bottom of it I, I would feel confident enough to do that and, and speak to the school about it but yeah I'm, I'm not sure about the historical ones but yeah I mean it's it's an access only and that's the same kind of that's what you get in all the school streets so it's effectively the same order yeah and there's nothing in the um the school street order that talks about the risk of uh, someone standing in the live carriageway. Well, that's, that's, that's covered under different areas of the law. So yeah, I think, all right, I'll scratch my head over that and I'll ask cleverer people than me. Uh, right. And I'll, I'll come back with more about the schools, uh, the, the play streets after Christmas. Brilliant. Yeah, we'll look forward to that one. I wanna, and, and yeah, I saw your partner in crime had an article out as well. Katia 
Oh, I've not seen that. Ah, yeah, no, I'll put a, I'll put a link in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah no, it, it looked quite good. One, one for reading. <laughs> okay, um, well, we'll move on because we've got lots of stuff to, to talk about. Um, our special guest, Stephen Wilkinson, are you there? He's going to talk to us about sustainable commuting. Uh, hi there. Yeah, I'm I'm Steve. Steve Wilkinson. Uh, hope you can hear me. Sorry, uh, not Stephen. Always get that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I used to work at uh, Leeds Beckett University for uh, 28 years. And uh, I, I live south of Wakefield, so I have to use a lot of active uh, commuting. Um, but by public transport, you know, train, I put my bike on the train. Then, then uh, when we moved up to Headingley, I would cycle... Uh, from Leeds station so I'd have to cycle uh, to the station in Wakefield, train to Leeds and then up to uh, Leeds and, uh, and back again. Um, so uh, you know th 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 that was my daily routine um, but for, for at least half of that time. Uh, but the, the thing was at 58 I, I had uh, a heart attack, I, I didn't see it coming, um, albeit though uh, I was very active uh, running for my running club, Wakefield Harriers, and uh, it was on the last leg of a 5K relay race, you know, bang, ambulance job, LGI, a couple of stents in, um, about a month later, angioplasty. I thought, I thought where, where did that come from? Anyway, the, the cardiologist said, uh, well, it's three things, Steve. Uh, one, you're a bloke. Uh, two, your stress is chuff. Uh, and three, you've been cycling through Leeds. Uh, every day you know for the last well at least 15 years you know before that sort of walking um i thought oh gee man i, I never saw that coming but then i used to think about my journey and how, how i could taste the petrol and the derv before i got on the train and, yeah i don't be spitting you know oh god you know my mouth just tastes like i've swallowed petrol and then uh, post um cardiac arrest you know i went through all my uh, physio recovery and everything and then i got part of a research program and um, whether they wanted to see if I was pre-diabetic and or whatever. Anyway, I cycled there, you know, so only six miles from south of Wakefield, Sandal, where I live, up to uh, north of Wakefield, to Finderfields. Anyway, it took a lot of blood off me and uh, chested me with glucose and also checked my breath as well. You know, you, you breathe into a machine and they said, hey, Steve, are you a smoker? You, you've got um, carbon monoxide in your blood, you know, in your breath. I thought, no, I've never been a smoker. I've just cycled up through rush hour traffic. So, oh, man, you know. But anyway, they, they always say, never get mad, get even. Uh, and so um, I wrote a paper um, for the Leeds Sustainability Institute, um, the SEEDS conference, which is all about environment and, uh, you know, how it could be more sustainable. And uh, it was to see how you could breathe less, uh, deeply, you know, reduce the volume of uh, air being taken into your lungs by perhaps using a, an electric bike. Um, so I, I decided to compare electric bikes with um, conventional bikes uh, because uh, lots of research has shown that you breathe, breathe three times the volume when you, you're working harder uh, than as if you are tootling along. Uh, and previous research has shown that safe limits for speed in uh, cycling in cities is nine mile an hour going uphill and I think it's uh, 11 mile an hour coming downhill. Uh, that was done by the, the Leeds uh, Transport Institute. So a lot of research is done on that. Anyway, I th thought I'd um, do my own. Uh, and so um, I did a comparison using uh, my heart rate monitor, GPS system and Strava and Fitbit and I put the graphs together to compare what your heart rate and what your incline is um, over a set route. Um, I've got a uh, presentation here. I'll try and get it to work. Um, if I share the screen and then um, if I press play and start and then click on share. Hello, my name is Steve Wilkinson and my paper is the sustainable uh, commuting looking at alternative approaches to commuting uh, to work. Um, we do have a major problem uh, with pollution in our cities, um, which is killing more of our population. 
9,500 Londoners every year, and then 30,000 people uh, UK wide. Um, Neville Street, for example, in Leeds, has the, is the most polluted street outside of London, exceeding the WHO limits by 2.2 times. Uh, it's mainly due to motorised vehicles, uh, giving out nitrogen oxide, carbon monoxide, and particulates uh, below 10 microns. These cause lung and heart disease, and there's a massive rise in asthma among young children. It is clear that uh, the lockdown has shown how bad pollution in cities is. Um, looking at Paris and London before and after lockdown, when there are no cars around, it, it's clear blue sky. Um, more shockingly, uh, when you research it, you find that uh, the car is king. Uh, people use it for very small distances. Uh, for example, the, uh, between one and two miles, car usage is 60% oh, of, of those journeys. Under five miles, it, it's even worse, 85%. And this is a typical distance most people will commute. The majority of people will commute distances under five miles. My typical commute was uh, from Lee City Station up to uh, heading the campus. Um, just over three and a half miles, um, 246 feet of climbing, a bit of a clog going up, 23 minutes or longer to take, get there, 70 minutes to get back to the station. Um, unfortunately, too many bus stops, too many Pelican crosses and junctions where cars um, Stop and start, bus stop and start, and that's where the most pollution is. Their cars are cold as well, uh, kicking out the most pollution. And when you exert in yourself, stopping and starting, climbing the pills, uh, you're breathing at three times um, higher during exertion, which is approximately 90 litres a minute. Too much. Anyway, I decided to do a test between the two different forms of commuting. One using a um, Really good 2003, 2013 full carbon racing bike, very light, very fast. Uh, the other was um, my old uh, commuting bike, which had previously been a uh, mountain bike in 1986. And then I converted to uh, taking my kids around. And then I used it uh, when I got moved up to Beckett Park from City Sites as a commuter bike, uh, which I put on the train and then uh, sat all the way from. Lee City Station, up to Eddingley uh, and back. Uh, anyway, I decided to convert it to an electric bike to see what the difference would be. Um, it's got Tongsheng 250 watt uh, motor, which, uh, play, which is a big mounted one, and also a massive battery, a bit too big really, 48 volts, 17.5 ampere hours. I compared to uh, both bikes uh, over a uh, long route, over 28 miles. The reason for this is that uh, lockdown prevented me from using the uh, heading of the commuter route, but I was still able to uh, record my heart rate against elevation uh, using a Fitbit with GPS and uh, Strava, uh, which showed all the segments that I met along the route. Graphs showed how hard it was to cycle over this 28 mile route with my uh, heart rate of 101 beats per minute, uh, 16 minutes at peak heart rate, 48 minutes at cardio rate for the racing bike. The graph for the electric bike just showed how uh, useful it was in giving assist over the hills and uh, maintaining a constant speed. Uh, over the same elevation. Also showed a massive reduction in uh, average heart rate down from uh, 101 beats per minute to 85 beats per minute average. Uh, more importantly, the peak heart rate dropped from 16 minutes to one minute and the cardio uh, was from 48 minutes down to 21. But it also showed that uh, 57 minutes were still dropped down into the fat burning zone. So it's still a very useful exercise. The uh, calculations that I used were uh, extracted from the Strava information 
uh, with the different elevations that were the same as the upper route. And basically, I calculated um, the distances and the breathing rate for both the electric bike and the racing bike. With the racing bike, I'm obviously working harder uh, up that elevation and then breathing more deeply, breathing more pollution in. Uh, I compared the two against the different breathing rates. And uh, for the uh, ordinary bike, it was 1,476 litres. For the electric bike, it was 615. So that's over 800 litres of pollution being saved. The uh, cost of the environment we're using a car is absolutely appalling. A British car, um, especially from cold, they're at the worst polluting. Uh, so for three and a half miles, it worked at 49.3 grams of nitrous oxide, 293 grams of carbon monoxide for petrol cars, and 201 grams of particulates from diesel. You multiply this by the thousands of cars that commute both ways up down off the road. The pollution is vast. Uh, the pandemic has shown that the general public will shy away from public transport and probably use more cars, causing more pollution, which is absolutely ridiculous. We must have uh, better cycle routes uh, so people can uh, cycle safely. They're similar to Holland and Denmark. They have five times as many cycles as we are. Um, because we're trying to avoid street canyons where all the pollution is uh, and avoid just having lines on the road. It's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, I would recommend the electric bike to cycle in the heavy traffic um, because uh, it helps uh, the impact on your lungs. Very useful for people who are unfit, while at the same time, um, you can still get into the fat burning zone, so you still get good exercise, but without the risk. Um, anyway, thank you so much for listening. All right, go out there. Good man, Steve. That, that was really interesting. Uh, yeah, I haven't quite put those two things together before, so it was really interesting. So I'm sure we're going to have a, a few questions, but I'm a uh, yeah, that whole, if you're riding in, in polluted areas, to think about an electric bike is a, is a real hook that I hadn't thought about before, you know, to reduce the, yeah, has anybody got any questions for Steve? Uh, yeah, that was brilliant. Can I just say, it's, uh, most of the stopping and starting, um, which is a problem, you know, you're really hiking on your pedals to get going again, especially when you've got buses, you know, that are uh, stopping and starting at different stops all the way up and, all the traffic lights and uh, junctions. And uh, I think it's the nature of um, the geography of places like Leeds and Sheffield, you know, you've got river valley cities and the, the pollution hangs down there. And the, and the, the high sided um, street canyons, you know, with the buildings on either side, it's shown that, you, you know, you get a, a vortex which keeps the pollution down, you know. So, you know, try to avoid routes that are on street canyons and, um, you know, away from maybe traffic, it's, it's you know, being segregated is the way to go. I'm, I must admit, my, my, my good friend, uh, Dr. Adam Cooper, he's a GP, you know, he helped me get running again. But on the back of that, he's helped develop a, a mask which can filter down to five microns. It's for runners and cyclists. I'm not plugging it at all, but he's done it for very altruistic reasons. And we've set up a little website called Run Air, Air being the name of um, the river in uh, Leeds. So that's runair.co.uk if you're interested in the sort of fight back in a way against uh, some of the pollution. But basically, well, we need fewer cars on the road and better segregated cycle ways and more people on bikes. But if we are going to have uh, bikes and cars, we've got to perhaps, you know, encourage the use of electric bikes, you know, uh, for all the stopping and starting and especially going to pills where you, you are breathing three times uh, the volume, you know, 90 litres uh, a minute is it's, it's not good and i thought i was fine i thought i was bulletproof running cycling but i wasn't <laughs> well yeah no i remember adrian davis who bob mentioned earlier like a uh, dr adrian davis he's always gone on and that's one of the real benefits of cyclists that you do do that that bigger breath in as you go along that's that's got so many like a uh, health giving potentials but if it is meaning that you're taking a uh, uh, particulates and like toxic metals deeper into your system then you know it causes inflammation of your arteries and so i've been told you know which yeah. is no good for your, your heart or, or your brain never mind your lungs 
Yeah, so it's definitely it's a, it's a factor when choosing your next bike, people, uh, I would say. Um, I think there was a couple of questions in the chat, but I'm too uh, thick to read them as, a, as I'm talking. If, if you want to unmute yourself and ask uh, Stephen a question, that, that'd be great. So, Brian, just yep. uh, Steve, that was brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'm really surprised that the, the link to COVID and particulates hasn't really been bigged up because that was the whole reason for the pop-up lanes in the first place this year, yeah. I thought. No, but very good point. And uh, you can see by the images uh, that, you know, I, I hate all the fake news, you know, uh, much of the research has shown that we've had a 60% drop in pollution because of less traffic around. The BBC will say 30%. You know, what's the real figure? But uh, to me, you know, cycling around in April and May, there was like wine, it was so sweet. You know, I thought, you know, this is the way it should be. You know, I know I, know I was born in the 50s, but, you know, it'd be lovely to get some of the um, fresh air back. Yeah, there, there were some reports that came out from our friends in the EU about the lives saved, the result of the, like, the improved air quality. So there's... There is some stuff out there if you if you hunt around, but yeah, th th we definitely didn't make a, enough of it um, from our side of it. Uh, any other questions for Steve before we move on to Chris? Yes, please. Yep, go for it. And Roxanne here. Um, uh -huh. a question in the chat about how do we balance the campaigning messaging in particular about needing cleaner air and the danger that air pollution has for people cycling and walking without scaring people away from active travel. Uh, so question for you on perhaps anyone else there, you know, I've, I've sort of thought before about doing a big protest where we all wear face masks and say, you know, this pollution is terrible, but you know, we've been afraid of that actually scaring people off. Funnily enough, from my mask making factory today. <laughs> so it's very yes. topical. What do you think? No, I, I think that's a, a fantastic idea that, that uh, I, I think, the way forward is, is obviously get fewer cars on the road but but in the meantime you know until we get things sorted out i think wearing a mask for both pollution and uh, covid is a very good thing uh, that's why my good friend as i say uh, dr adam cooper has been developing a mask that you can actually breathe and run in he, he ran uh, the great north run using a, a mask all the way around in one hour 29 and it was a month, couple of months short of being 60 fantastic runner but uh, it just shows you that you can get mass, that you can breathe uh, deeply in. Uh, I mean, some of my old cycling masks, I went all the way around with two vents. I found I were getting little black spots in front of my uh, eyes. I've been stupid, I've been a, a lecturer, you know, I, I had a lot of responsibilities and I'd always leave it while the last minute and gun it down to the station in about 17 minutes. And you just don't think, you know, um, you know, you need to breathe. But I think the thing is, if, uh, segregated cycling routes uh, plans strategically away from um, cars are not just white line next to a main busy road but it needs thinking through um, properly but I think in the before we can get this thing sorted out uh, I think the masks are, the, yours look very good there Roxane um, are one of the solutions but get one that you can breathe in and get some filtering down to at least five microns I think but it still won't stop the gas going into your um, well, it may do, I think, with the right sort of mask. But the nitrous oxide, as I say, causes inflammation in your arteries and your brain and lungs. But definitely don't frighten people away from uh, being commuters. Otherwise, we won't solve this problem at all. We've got to push on somehow, you know. But it was a very good question. Thank you. I hope I haven't rambled on too much. Thank no, you. It's, it's been brilliant and fascinating. And I'm like, uh, the, the research that came into my mind was, uh, I think it was a uh, uh, Dr. James Woodcock uh, in Cambridge that that did the the research of how long you'd have to be exercising to um, for the effect of pollution to override the benefits of the exercise. I said that in a really bad way, but I'm always like that with academic stuff. Um, and it, this is a really interesting nuanced thing that that I'd love to to see as part of that research. So uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it's some great stuff. Any any other questions? Or, or, yeah, I think, could I ask a question? Uh, please, yeah, go on, Graham. Um, in Oxford, uh, St Aldate's is on a, a, a mild slope. It's in the middle of town, going past the town hall. And it's also a kind of bus station. So there are frequently two or three buses idling, well, waiting to deposit and pick up passengers. And it's often thought, I've often thought, um, as I've smelt the, uh, the crap as I've 
gone by. <laughs> yeah, that's the right word. Yeah. On, the, on the way to work, I've often thought, I wonder, I wonder what the concentration. You mentioned Street Canyon. It immediately rang a bell because I thought, yeah, how, long it a how long does it take a bus, kind of five liters or whatever it is, ticking over, to actually fill the entire space with increasing, um, increasing uh, density of uh, CO, presumably, and other things. I mean. I th I think, yeah, I think it concentrates because air blows up the top of the buildings and creates this vortex and just circulates it around. The, you know, there's been a lot of many studies on that, the airflow around cities and the way it keeps the pollution down. In fact, it, it can be concentrated. And they're not given the proper figures of what the true pollution is. You know, like I say, 2.2 times uh, um, world art exceeding wealth health organization um, standards in, in Leeds, you know, by the station where I'm. I was as a commuter for 28 years. You know, that, that exceeds Mexico City and uh, Bangalore, you know. It's, it's mental. <laughs> yeah, there's a few local authorities that do do um, like uh, quality, like 3D models now of the effect of buildings and stuff. And, you know, we, we should be taking that seriously, particularly when you've got a hot spot like you have obviously got in Leeds there. And I know that route particularly well, having uh, lived on that campus for a year when I was at Leeds. Oh, oh, <laughs> so yeah, that, that was my route into the university as well. So uh, yeah, that was uh, any, a key one, isn't it? For, um, uh, getting, digging further into the, the 3D modeling that you were talking about? Yeah, yeah, like uh, maybe we should uh, cover that. I think we've got a potential topic. Uh, I was at a session with the City of London and they had uh, really sophisticated models going on. They were, were taking it really seriously and I uh, uh, saw a big 3D model of all the air quality based on the buildings and the new buildings and they could trigger stuff in there. It was like, you know, quite advanced computing because there's so many variables, but if they had a very accurate representation. I don't think they're the only people doing that. So, uh, yeah, well, I'll... I'll Try and get some of the people in behind that, and we'll uh, we'll cover that as a topic because it's it's such a hot one. It's really resonating with people, the air quality, and uh, and that that's made me think. And I've been like putting off getting an electric bike, thinking, no, Brian, you need the exercise. But uh, yeah, there's some pretty polluted roads that I ride on as well. That's uh, yeah. Sorry, you can do it for a very very low cost if you do it yourself. You've got an old bike then. The, the key factor is it's going to be 62. Sorry, 68. Uh, between 68 and 72 millimetres on the bottom bracket. And it's about 270 for the motor, but the, the batteries are quite expensive, They're about between two or 300, depending on the size. So they, they can be a lot cheaper than a bought electric bike, you know. So, okay. you know, let's go there if you can do with the spanners. All right. Well, actually, I know a person who can answer lots of questions about bikes. See the way I'm segueing. Uh, we'll kind of move on. We can, we can come back to this topic, but I'll introduce like a, our final like a guest, uh, Chris Boardman, and and like he, I'm told he hasn't what got... Do you mean? What do you mean, like a guest? <laughs> what does that mean, like a guest? I am a guest, Brian. You are a guest, uh, just like a, a, a CEO, but yeah, you're more of a boss to me. <laughs> so, so I'm just going to like uh, open it up to people, like uh, let's ask Chris all those tricky questions that I've kind of uh, hidden off the camera for over, over the last like uh, nine months. Um, Chris is here, he's definitely near the seat of knowledge, so has anybody got any interesting questions? If there's lots, maybe stick them in the chat and I'll actually look at the chat and then, then call you out to do it. Um, but like, someone can be cheeky and just come in right now and ask one while I'm looking well, at Well, why don't you get going, Brian? Um, so first of all, I'm sorry, I was going to make this festive and put a nice backdrop on, but I couldn't find anything, so I've just got to do it in the office as is, so um, apologies for that. Uh, I hope the sound's okay. You're helping me testing the microphone at the moment. And I, I said, Brian. Ah, it was okay. And then you touched something and it went. Someone's turned him down. Oh, what's going on? Yeah, this is a bad test of your new microphone, Chris. We can confirm oh, that. A joke, I think. <laughs> okay, how's that? Oh, that's good. Uh, there you go. I'll, I'll broadcast okay. actually start. Um, I'll yeah, finish yeah. that sentence now. I oh. said to you that you know, I haven't prepared anything, so you better just make it Q&A. But while I've been listening to everybody, I've actually made a few notes. So if it's okay, while you have a look at a couple of questions, I wouldn't mind sharing a couple of thoughts. I'm hopefully a couple of solutions as well. Um, is that okay? Yeah, all good. 
Well, I, I've just noticed that we've got, what is it, 116 very passionate and very knowledgeable people here. Um, and we all know why we should be changing the way we move around, and that's, that's why we're all here. Um, and, and it just made me think, my, my biggest worry for next year is the othering of cyclists. And I think we've had a little glimpse of that in the Daily Mail. We've seen Nigel Farage. Um, and I think that is going to be the biggest threat next year. Uh, and, and I think not controlling the message is going to be huge. Now, so, because it made me think of it because I'm listening to the facts and the stats and the data and it's all bang on. And they are the foundation on which you need that to build a house. But you never buy a house by talking about the foundation. And we never go, oh, these are great foundations. I'm going to buy that house because it's got smashing foundations. We don't. Um, we look at all the nice stuff and the, the, the peripheral things that are on it. So I, I, I'm trying to illustrate, really, that I don't want to demean that. It's absolutely essential. We shouldn't go forward without it. But that's not how people are going to buy this house. They're going to do it because it looks appealing, because they're scared of the alternative, and all of those things that are being used against us. And I think we need to make sure that cyclists are seen um, about, as one of us. In fact, I try very hard, as you know, to not use the word cyclists. I want to talk about what it lets us do, moving around without cars. So I think we need to be talking about getting to the match and going to the kids with, school, with the schools without a car and, and try very hard not to mention the word cycling. Um, and make sure people are portrayed at all times as one of us, same clothes as me, talking the same way as me, talking about the same things that I like. Again, you know, the football and, and all of the things that you can just do without a car. Um, and one observation, I really like to keep the anger because anger makes headlines, but make sure it's pointing in the right direction. So I, I am outraged, incandescent with rage that that our streets have been allowed to have been taken away from us. In just 10 years, 1.7 billion extra miles on our local roads in Greater Manchester. 44% more traffic running outside my house now. And no one consulted me about that. You've taken away my right to, to get around without a car. And, I, and we need to hang on to that and make sure it is all about the problem and not the cyclist is the problem because that's gonna come at us hard and fast with what is it, 30 active neighborhoods we've got on the books. Um, it, we're gonna be getting an awful lot of it. I'll come back to active neighborhoods in a second. Um, and I think, um, I mean, even stuff today, and this is just thinking out loud. So it, it, I was looking at Rachel Aldred's uh, paper today uh, and seeing that, what is it, 35% more dangerous to have a painted white line than nothing. Well, I'm starting to think, is a council liable if they have data like that and they go ahead and do it anyway? Yeah, fuck's sake. And that's the kind of thing that uh, there's, there's fear, greed, um, well, they're the main ones, to be honest, fear and greed, and they're the two things that make headlines um, and spectacular, and we need to make sure it's pointing in the right direction. So, yes, get the stats, get to the facts. Uh, uh, people out there, not interested. I'm interested in, does it save me enough money to go on holiday at the end of the year with the kids? You know, that, that, I'm interested in that. Is it easier? I don't have to find a parking space. Quite interested in that. And I think that's the messaging. And messages is what this is all going to be about. Um, going back to, um, I mean, this is really embryonic. I'm thinking out loud. I mean, I haven't really discussed it with people at work. So I'd just like you to think about it, really. I can see that by making low traffic neighborhoods, it's the fastest way to get things done. And I can do it cheaply and I can create space. And I'm, re I'm really attracted by them because we can do things quick and then the links that stick them together and suddenly I've got space that's usable and I can use schools as the centerpiece for it. So I, I can actually tap into that emotional thing that we all care about. But by calling them, well, we, it's too late now. By doing it as a package, we've made it big enough to shoot at. We've made a thing in a low traffic neighborhood that I can campaign against. And um, we know that, uh, what is it, about 800 point closures, if that's the right collective term, have been found in Bolton uh, by one of, uh, one of our number. And 
and it's already there. And it made me think we don't talk about them because they're all single small things that are just part of the streetscape. Uh, and and if I if, if there was a piece of A4 paper on a lamppost saying I'm just going to make this road into a cul-de-sac, you might get a couple of grumbles and everybody finds the way around. And, but it's just not big enough to get enough noise to stop something happening. There's not going to be a big protest. But what if if I had 30 low traffic neighbourhoods to deliver in a space of two years? What if I did 100 of those closures a month but spread across an entire city region, not joined up? And it was just one thing. And then I did another thing in all of those places and another thing until eventually I'd created it. But at no point did I make a massive momental uh, moment change when everybody's life was going to be disrupted, something to get upset about. So just something to think about, really. If that's how we got 1.7 billion extra miles being driven in the last 10 years and no complaints because we didn't ask and we did it over 10 years and after 10 years it's now normal and people are upset and I'm going to take that away and we're at a tool that we're not using time because we want to do it and we want to do it quick but if I delivered it all in 10 years but we'd done it like pieces of the jigsaw around the board instead of get all this bit together and another bit together uh, it might be a tool that we could use to to our advantage. So quite random stuff there, but uh, I just thought I'd plant that with this group and, and maybe have a little bit of a think about it. But this next year is going to be all about the messaging. Uh, and I think it's going to be the decider on whether we win or lose. Nice. All right. I'm going to go to the questions in the order that I spotted them. <laughs> might not say be the correct order and um, i'm gonna ask uh, bob i know bob's already spoke but you know he's part of the team bob did, did you want to come in yeah i wanted to say yes it is all you're yeah, absolutely correct i mean this thing about othering um i was talking about prejudice against cycling and what it can mean um in my book which came out in 1993 and uh, it's tremendously important because uh, as we're always told by motorists and road safety people, it's very easy to do the wrong thing when you're driving. And if you have a negative view of someone else, then it's something which does have potentially extremely serious consequences. Because uh, the point is that when you're driving, you actually have to operate positively. You can't just do it as a normal everyday thing. Therefore, uh, that's why all the stuff being done by Active Travel Academy and that I'm trying to do is terribly important. Um, also, even if you say, right, we're not going to talk about actually what drivers do, we're going to talk about infrastructure and how we get it in. It isn't something that you can just kind of slip in while nobody's noticing, as we've seen with something like Kensington High Street. You know, you actually have to wage the cultural struggle, the ideological struggle, as Marxists would say, uh, in order to get the highway authority to do the right things. You can't say, oh, yeah, I'm just going to fiddle around with the, the way the highway's laid out and it'll all be OK. You actually have to wage that fight continually, persistently. And I'm afraid I would go even further. And uh, this is something that I have to say because my background actually originally is in a cycle racing club. And I remember back in the eighties, the lads, uh, you know, like young lads were people who liked to drive fast. And even though they were people who were particularly at risk because of the, the large mileages, which we did in those days, and on roads with high speed limits, etc. The fact is that even if you are a cyclist, even if you begin to see it as a normal thing, you've got to actually deal with what motorists get up to. So I'm afraid it's a persistent, continual, continuous struggle, which we have to wage at that level of what people think without necessarily being fully aware of it. That's what culture is. It's about background assumptions. It's about hidden agendas. It's about all that kind of stuff. So continual, continuous struggle. That's it. Chris, have you got any comments on that comment? 
I didn't spot a question. No, I know. I was waiting for it. Um, well, I, I, I wouldn't agree with, disagree with that. I'm sorry if it, it came across that I was saying we should do everything in bits. Um, clearly, uh, I don't think that. I think it allows us to focus on where the battles need to be. And it might be a tool for reluctant councillors to get them to agree to steps, knowing where it's going to lead over a period of time, as opposed to having a massive battle um, that they're just not strong enough to take on. So a strategic tool that we might want to consider doing it in pieces. I think ideally you want to get low traffic neighbourhoods in particular, we, we call them active neighbourhoods. Uh, you want to get them in, in one hit if you can, so you can create an example and show that the pollution's dropped and get imagery of the kids walking to school, absolutely. Um, but the reality is in some places, if we want what's best, we won't get anything. So we might need to do this, exactly the same thing, but spend a slightly longer period of time doing it. Uh, and as I also said, it's embryonic. I'm just putting it out there, but it certainly wasn't being suggested as a panacea for how we should do everything. Right, uh, Shivaji, do you want to come in with your, I think you had a couple of questions, but hopefully let, let's try and be brief for them, <laughs> says. Okay, so <clears throat> thanks. I suppose the first for me was really about the, the constant attack that low traffic neighbourhoods are all about taking traffic from um, privileged areas and imposing that traffic on less well off people, on black and minority ethnic communities, however it's normally put. Um, I, I'm not discouraged by those criticisms directly from wanting a low traffic neighbourhood, but it's not all, always easy to know how to respond. Any, any thoughts on that? Well, I think you banged on. I mean, the, the nice thing is it's so stereotypical. All of the arguments are, are pretty much the same wherever you are in the country, you know, be it access for emergency vehicles, what about the disabled, um, what about the pollution you're causing elsewhere and all of the things and the ones you just mentioned it's about 10 isn't there um so we're hard at work right now trying to get ahead of the game we're actually behind the game because we've had a couple of low active uh, low traffic neighborhoods active neighborhoods uh, already come on the fire and have been pushed back because because we weren't ready i think a lot a lot of that was politics that was another big learning this year in that um we collectively for a region might know what we want to do, but it's the council owns the roads. And if they want to do it their way, and this is the way we've done it for 20 years, we don't have the power to intervene. You know, we, we, we need to be invited. So that's one element really. Um, but I think for the next year, when the vast majority start to go in and we start this work in earnest, we, we are working to get answers to those 10 questions, nice, strong ones, all in there and a lot of the time of course you can allay the fears um, we had councillor John Burke I did something with him earlier this week and he, he encapsulated one point really well he said no low traffic neighbourhood pushes any traffic onto a main road main roads have pushed the traffic into the neighbourhoods um, and I, that's quite a nice strong little statement I think um, but I think it's also really important that we going back to evidence that we we also be very careful not to try and sell it too much. And in some cases, we need to say, you know what? The traffic is going to go up. It's not going to go up by much everywhere it's been done. And eventually it comes back down, but it is going to go up. Well, what's your alternative? 90 to 95% of roads are carrying traffic now that they shouldn't be. You saying we should leave that the same for the sake of that road, or should we benefit 95% of people who live on those roads um, instead, I mean, it's. I think we we need to. We know the questions. We need to prepare strong, short, soundbite answers that talk about the things that the people who've got to change value. Um, and that goes back to my point at the start. So I think it, um, the short answer I've just rambled on is, is that yes, we're on that, and hopefully they're going to be public in the next few weeks and months. Um, we're getting sound bites from local businesses. So for example, um, over in the Northern Quarter, um, we're gonna go and speak to the businesses. In fact, it's already in hand to say, what did you think when they said we were gonna close these roads? Uh, what did you think when the roads were closed? And how would you feel if we said we're gonna take it out? So we have now examples where we can go and ask real people the questions, go and speak to the emergency services and get them to say, 
no, actually, we are consulted on every single scheme. We're part of the design process and we're happy with this. So try and get all of that information up front. Package it up into 20 second bites because that's social media. People won't watch a 15 minute video. Um, I'm throwing a question in there as well. Which one of these do you want to get people engaged? Because questions are brilliant for that. So, so we're on it. And, and as soon as that starts to come out, hopefully it can be used by other people around the country. I mean, that's how we're learning is we're going to look we're looking everywhere else, speaking to people that are on this, this call um, to find out things that I can take back and use in Greater Manchester. That would be fantastic. And I've got to say that in terms of the, the resources you're talking about, it would be great if that includes sound bites from people in the categories that are being used against us. So, so we're often told that the disabled, as though it's one oh, amorphous block, is, oh, are man. being disadvantaged by low traffic neighbourhoods. And having some disabled people saying, I'm not the same as that guy over there, he's also disabled, but for yeah. me it works better, or, you know, I'm sceptical, but I can see that it could work, would be yeah. brilliant. No, we've got enough examples now to do exactly that, and that is um, precisely our intention. Brilliant. And that feeds into the second question that, oh, that Brian it, referred to, it which is... Can you in for the second question in a minute, just because of the couple of, of people uh, waiting uh, that will probably uh, beat me up if I don't let them answer a question. But but I will come back, because I think you've got a really good second question as well. I'll just bring uh, Lucy now. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Um, so actually, just a comment on the issue of liability. I think that's really interesting at the moment, because not only... I mean, it's always amazed me that authorities have not are not held responsible when people are killed um, because we know exactly how to design out these deaths um, but the other thing is when you see authorities putting in cycle lanes and then removing them that to me really raises the question of liability if there is then somebody killed or, or injured um, but yeah i just wanted to raise a question ready for you chris um, about um, do you think there's any way we can really capitalize on um, children in in a sense that they've really had their right to independent we capitalize on children sorry their right to independent play taken away so when you look at when you look at like the engagement process that the dft put forward they talk about you know they say go and talk to the royal mail go and talk to the businesses no mention whatsoever of children and they just don't seem to sort of hit the radar in terms of inclusion um yeah, and so that's kind of my question. But also, just quickly, there's a scheme in Hammersmith and Fulham using ANPR cameras, and it's been incredibly successful so far, and it's not very visible. And I think that sort of helps, but they're generating a lot of income, um, and it's reduced traffic on the main road sur surrounding the low-traffic neighbourhood. So I just wondered also, maybe that's a, a way forward that's less visible. But the children... Okay. Uh, I didn't fully hear the last one because I'm a bit deaf and in Europe. A bit of a distance from the mic for me um so the first bit totally i think that's a really interesting take because i mentioned fear and greed well you have to think about who am i speaking to what are they scared of and what do they don't want to miss out on so when you've got cash for example um everybody wants a piece so if you have cash and standards you can't have it unless you meet these standards so i've got a great a greed i don't want to miss out and, and i want a piece of that so that's great um with councillors, the fear that councillors were scared of getting sued, um, or not councillors, sorry, councils. Um, so if you can actually show by not acting, by not doing this thing, you're at risk, then you really give them an incentive to, to go out and do it. And, you know, we're, we're doing a piece of work on side road zebras at the moment. And I don't know, I can guess where I think that's going to lead. But if it does happen to lead to show that this demonstrably makes it safer to cross the road, and, and it really helps. And we've got accidents in those places um, and somebody wants us to stop in doing it. It may be that actually there's a real threat there of, well, if you're gonna go against the evidence, you might end up in court. So it's a tool that, that can be used. Um, as far as exploiting children, um, I'm a big fan of that, having six of them. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that I really like the whole low traffic neighborhood thing. Um, and if we, would really like to work with schools that are close to the ones that we have pending so we can give it maximum leverage for that's a focal point whether you're a motorist or you ride a bike or whatever you however you get around kids is something we have in common 
and it's something we value. And if anything threatens that, we get angry. So if we want to make space for kids, we've got a strong moral case to do something there. Um, and then we can get imagery and sound bites of them going to school without being driven there. Big chunk of the, uh, the traffic on our road school runs, of course. I think that's a great focal point and it's very hard to argue against. Um, so I really do like, like working with schools to do something good, I think is a, a great focal point. Because that's the problem, there's so many things we can do. There's like a hundred fires here, so which 10 are gonna kill me first? Well, what's gonna get me the best return? And I think schools is a great focal point for work like this. Brilliant. Uh, right, at this stage, there's five people that want to ask questions and we are running out of time. So I'm going to say, try I'll and keep it short. Yeah, well, yeah, you're the star. That's all right. I'm not going to I'm not going to hush you along. Uh, but like, try and keep the questions to 30 seconds. I just used about uh, 15 seconds saying that. Um, should we go to Joseph? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Great. Good to meet you, Chris. Um, I've been, I've got a group of people together. We signed a letter to the NHS and we were basically pushing. It's great for emergency travel, but we can't leave bikes at hospitals because they get nicked. The hospital in Newcastle made 12 arrests with the police because staff's bikes got nicked. They published a net zero commitment and it included walking, cycling and public transport promotion. How do you kind of imagine this merging in. So it's great the cycling's going in, but the destination, like the fire services, the police, NHS, uh, schools, all these workplaces need to like up their game with storing bikes or you're just not gonna get people commuting in. What would you suggest from your perspective? Well, it'd be great in first instance if employers could take responsibility for it. I mean, that would be, that would be a big plus and it gets us going, but I think there's a whole um, police side of this that we haven't addressed that I mean it's to do with speeding it's, it's to do with people just based on really poor behavior and there's poor behavior because it's not being penalized not many people work to um, mor a moral code is the is the crude reality they work to consequences and if there's no consequences then I'll do what's the easiest thing for me and then as more people do that around me be it parking on a pavement or um, nicking a bike it becomes normalized um, and, and that needs to be addressed so I think that with the police it's linked to funding and I would very much like to find a way to be have funding for you to do these specific things um, and so one of the things that we're working on is being able to keep one of the commission all the five commissioners uh, across the UK got together and asked government for five things which you might be aware of and one of them was uh, the power to keep fines locally so we can do the things, we can start to, it's not specifically bike theft, but we, we can enforce against bad behaviour and then keep the funds and then put it back into that, that area, which helps us politically as well um, with people in, the, in that street. This, this camera's there just to make money. Well, yeah, it is. But only off people who are endangering you. And we're going to take that money and we're going to put it back into your street. So I think they're the kind of things that I'm already thinking, how can we fund it? But we need a much better policing system and just telling the police to do better when they're underfunded and understaffed um, is not gonna help. We've got to go, I've, I've got to go to them with, with a partial solution as well. But I completely agree, bike security is huge. And I guess with a lot of people this year in homes, when there's people that are have been dependent on crime, be it drugs um, or whatever, then if you're in your home, I can't burgle it. I'm mean, gonna need the cash, what am I gonna do? And probably bikes were a fairly easy target this year. So I've got an answer to that, which was the very long-winded way of saying it, but I've got ideas that we're working on. Good man, uh, Roxanne. Hello, uh, a quick one on cycle theft. Um, we need to get a national campaign together to work on, on Gumtree and Facebook to put more protections in place to prevent um, sale of stolen bikes. So get in touch with me. I'm, my MP is very interested in this. There's a few things going on. Um, oh, that's brilliant. my question, but <laughs> just- no, no, that's great. That's brilliant. Yep, and, and Chris, if, if we could call on you at the right time to help make some comments on that, that would be fantastic. Um, no, absolutely. I mean, I think we found across social media, the things that have happened since 2016, we've realised its power um, uh, and, and what it can achieve, regardless of facts, or you know, despite facts being in the opposite direction. Um, and the fact that it can be used to shift 
stolen goods with impunity is wrong. And it's something that um, at, a, at a governmental level, they could act on, and it's probably politically palatable as well, if they're given something to do that they can stand in front of and look good, and it's not going to um, lose them votes. And something like this would probably fit the bill. Yep. Uh, and for police and crime commissioners, they've been very interested in this. Anyway, my question, um, Chris, I'm also very worried about the battle we'll be facing next year. Seeing Farage weighing into the anti-cyclist propaganda is very concerning. I think to counter this, we need really positive marketing campaigns about cycling. And I think particularly focusing on school streets and children, but this takes resource. I'm from Cambridge Cycling Campaign. We're fortunate we've got three staff members and we can't keep up with the, the battle we have to keep these positive comms going out. Um, do you have any ideas of how those places without the fortune of having a, a cycling commissioner um, to stand up for us, where can we get that resource to do the marketing that government, local authorities, the industry is not doing? Do, we, do you think there's a way that we could as a somehow come together and get grant funders to maybe put something behind us nationally I know Adam Tranter is doing some great work. I hope your question's about this too, Adam. But anyway, how can we do this marketing at grassroots level without resources? How can we get resources? Can you help? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I really don't know. But I do know that the, the power of social media, we can do an awful lot for free because a good story sells. So you've probably seen uh, Tom Flood on Twitter. Uh, at Tom Flood, one used to work in the car industry. Now he's a bit of a convert, um, and I don't, I don't think all of his messaging is brilliant. But he's coming at it from a completely different angle. He knows that the rules are it must be twenty seconds long, and he knows that a question pulls you in. You know, something. That, what do you want for your kids? Not lots of information, just some pictures, and then a question at the end. You could do an awful lot with that. Um, so just, just listening to. The whole othering thing, I would want to be outraged to this is my child, you know, this is, you know, is he a damn cyclist? You know, that kind of messaging that I think we could push out there. And there's a lot of people that will, will connect, pick it up and put it back out there. So one of the things that we've been doing recently is we've been going and looking outside of the cycling world mm -hmm. to other places. We've been looking at Guinness adverts and all sorts of things that make you feel good and asking, how do they do that? What have they just done? What? How do they make me want to be in that club? And they connect emotionally. And that's free. That's driven by imaginations and a phone camera. And we can do that. So I think coordination, funds is great, um, but we can do an awful lot without it, I think. All right, Adam, I'll bring you in. I'm, I'm going to be strict on my 30 second rule now. Oh, okay. Sorry. Hi, hi Chris. Um, I've spoken to some Telegraph journalists off, off the record and, and tried to find out why they seem to hate cycling so much. And um, it apparently comes from the bosses thinking that there's a perceived lack of consultation. They think that that's the unacceptable bit. Given that we know that there's wider uh, spread when you go out of the, the populism in the normal folk there is widespread support for cycling two-thirds of people are generally supportive um the in the midlands there's nine percent of voters saying that the environment's the most important thing compared to five percent for the nhs at the moment how do you think we're better off rather than trying to do everything as quickly as possible building a stronger and more, more robust consultation framework on a narrative that this is not a referendum but this is something needs to change and more if not now then when if not this then what and kind of setting the status quo is something needs to change what is it and how we're gonna how are we gonna make the changes that we need to do because someone's got to do it well you'll know more about commerce than anybody here um you know you bring a lot of expertise to this field um and you're probably pained and seeing the same things that we are that oh this this is a fantastic product and it's just been thrown on the table as they were whatever and, and it's like, oh, you've got to, got to tell people how fantastic it is and get up front. And, um, and I, I think there's two, two observations. One is you don't start with a blank piece of paper, I'm afraid. You start in the middle of it and it's all going on everywhere. Uh, and so when I started this job, you pick up some schemes and some of them aren't great. And it's like, right, do I try and kill it or do I just let that one go? And so we've got to, we've, 
we've got to do two things. I think we've got to develop an expertise um, and then share that expertise. And we've got to do it on the hoof. Uh, and it means that for the next 12 to 18 months, there's going to be some real tragic losses because all councils have all, this is just a consultation. We've done this for 30 years and it's not, it's culture change and it's huge. Uh, and so a lot of people are going to get burned and they're going to learn the lesson the hard way. But what we really need is some great examples of a consultation done well, nicely recorded, and then the ability, probably through mechanisms like this, for a council who's just been burned and say, come and have a look at this. Do you want these people to do it for you? Or do you want to copy what they've done uh, and link up that expertise? So it's going to be messy and we're going to lose battles along the way uh, for sure. But I think organically we're going to grow some great consultation um, material because we need to. So I'm not quite sure if that answers the question. I think both was the uh, was the answer really. All good. Tom? Hi there, I'll keep it really quick. It's a bike trade question, Chris, uh, with people changing modes and trying to get people shifted onto cycling. Carlton Reed was telling us, I think not so long ago, he was worried there was gonna be a worldwide shortage of 700C inner tubes soon. What's the bike trade supply side, both parts and bikes looking like for the next few months into the next year? And, and when do you think it will resolve? Well, go tubeless would be the first piece, piece of advice. <laughs> uh, the best way to, to not have a problem is to take away the cause. Um, but that, that little micro piece of um, advice aside, um, no, it's, it's really under stress at the moment for lots of different reasons. I mean, I know that... Um, that Halfords have really struggled for stock and everybody else is. China's doing really well at the moment. It's not having to export as much as it did before. Um, there was a lot of concern about anti-dumping tax being taken away, making British manufacturing not competitive. Luckily that's been dealt with, which was good, proactive. Um, there's a lot of the world's stock of containers currently full of PPE, um, which people don't realize. So containers are a finite resource and they're full of PPE at the moment, and they're being stored all around the world and just not moving, they're not in circulation. So it's, um, it's a problem that's gonna go on for the foreseeable. It's not just the cycling industry, which is good. Uh, you might find it's, it's happening to cars as well. And it, I would say it's gonna take at least 12 months to sort through. And Brexit, from a very parochial UK point of view, Brexit is huge. The amount of uncertainty is, is unbelievable there are people not shipping to the uk now because they they're just waiting to see what happens they can't have cash tied up stuck in a port waiting to see whether it can get in or not and we're going to have to work through that for a few months but i would suggest you probably best case six months um worst case 12 months away from from getting a nice consistent supply back in place thanks chris Excellent. Shivaji, do you want to come in with question two? This will be the last question, I think, and then we'll uh, go to Ruth's uh, wrap up. But I'll, I'll let you come well, back. Thank you. Um, like lots of other people, um, we're beginning to see the odd councillor wobble a bit in yep. Birmingham. So what are your key tips for keeping them strong? Well, there's probably more I can learn from people here than, uh, than I have advice to give because I've been at the planning stage of this and I've not been through it like lots of the people here before. And so we've gone through it and I'm encountering a lot of these issues for the first time. So one piece of advice that served me well is put your shoes in the person that I'm speaking to and think about what they need, what you, not what you want them to do. So a counselor, they might be a shopkeeper or, or a locksmith or and they've got a day job and they're doing this thing for whatever reason, lots of different reasons, and they just don't need the grief. And if I'm going to get battered for this, I'm either A, I don't need it, and so I'll avoid it, or I'm not going to be a counsellor anymore, so I can't do it. So you have to think, what do they need? What do they need to in order to succeed, in order to back this? And they've got to believe it's winnable. I think one of the most powerful things that, that we've done um, and we need to do more of, so we got Clyde Lokes from Waltham Forest to come down and give a talk uh, just over a year ago. Um, and he was able to show you know, the, him in the middle of a protest with people with coffins on the shoulder saying this is the death of Waltham Forest High Street. And all the councillors in the room are going, oh, yeah, that looks really horrible. And then he walked them through the journey of the political will and how quickly it changed 
and how they went from 44% of people absolutely outraged, just 1.7% of people wanted it turned back. And most importantly for a councillor, the share of the vote went up for all of the people that supported it and it went down for all of the people who were opposing it. And that's really strong. That says, oh, okay, so if I have this pain, there's really good evidence that it's not just a nice thing, which I quite like, but people are going to like me for it. Um, and I think letting them see that is, is really important, that there is evidence that shows why this is a good thing. Excellent. I think that's a really thanks nice place to, to round it up. So uh, I'll say thanks to all the speakers and I'll, I'll pass over to Ruth, who's going to do our, our last word because uh, we like that. Ruthie uh, there. Passover is very apt being as who I am. Um, well, we've had, a, we've had a lot of very heavy stuff and I just want to be a bit jolly this time because um, I cycled all my life to work, commuting, cycling, before it was even called commuting, but I just did it, mostly in skirts and high heels because that's what we did and never ever thought about having a shower. Um, but once I retired, uh, I wanted to cycle further and be more uh, um, adventurous. So local cycling campaign, London cycling campaign has lots of cycling groups and they run lots, run lots of rides and I know all around the country they do. It's really important to do that and especially for women of my age, I'm teetering towards 70 now, uh, and women and in my group, which is an informal group, we go out on a Wednesday, we go out on a Friday, we don't have rules um, and we just have a lovely time which involves coffee, lunch and tea. In the winter when they're shorter, we go to art exhibitions, we do cultural things as well. And I just think it's really important to enjoy cycling because cycling is so joyous and it's so fabulous. And, you know, just keep doing it and, you know, be positive about it. And let's not too much about the danger because, you know, strictly speaking, it isn't. It's just not pleasant. And it's not pleasant because we're sharing with very big vehicles and what have you. But I mean, I've cycled around the A25 and I would never have done that before. But I can do it now. Oh, my point being, the confidence I've got from group cycling is phenomenal. And I now cycle at night and I now do very long distances that I would not have done. So group cycling, get your friends, persuade someone to come out with you. Bike Buddies is brilliant. LCC is brilliant. Wheel Easy, I must give the nod to in Harrogate because they're fabulous. It's my sister. Um, so look those kind of places up and enjoy cycling. It's great.